Welcome to worship with Memorial United Methodist Church in Gladstone, Michigan. I'm Kathy Rafferty, the pastor here, and I am glad that you and I and God are joined together to worship. While the building may be closed, Memorial Church is enthusiastically open to proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ. If you connect with us on our website or Facebook or send us your email, we'll do our best to keep you up to date with what's happening here, including providing an at-home worship guide and a children's page to go along with our Sunday videos. You can see our contact info at the end, and we're still checking the U.S. mail phone messages. Now, if you've been following along, you may recall we're journeying through the season of Easter from mid-April until Pentecost Sunday on May 31st. On Easter Sunday, we proclaim, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. And we'll do it again every Sunday from now until Pentecost. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Christians down through the centuries have realized that it may take a little time for us to wrap our heads and our hearts around the wonder of resurrection. That may be especially true this year. So we're taking our time with the resurrection stories of the Gospels through these Sundays in the Easter season. Each week we're focusing on one of the stories of the risen Christ, appearing to women and men who had lost hope, lost faith, lost direction. Stories of the uncertainty and doubt, confusion, disappointment, gradually giving way to transformed lives, to larger perspectives and fresh energy, to resurrection reality. I hope you'll stay with us through all of the Easter season as we navigate our way through these uncertain times. As we get started today, will you please join with me in a spirit of prayer? Risen Christ, you are the way, the truth, and the life for which we long. As we come before you in worship, may we experience the power of your resurrection, the reality of your presence, and the abundance of your grace so that we too may rise up to proclaim your love. Amen. Let's take a few deep breaths as we continue to center ourselves for worship. As we hear Debbie Hubbard play the Easter hymn, Up From the Grave Heroes, and have a look around the sanctuary.
A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 62 through 66. The next day after Jesus was crucified, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he had he has been ri ra raised from the dead and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by stealing or sealing the stone. The reading from the Gospel of Matthew continues, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord was descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly to, and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead and indeed is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. They will see me there. The reading from the Gospel of Matthew continues, chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. While they were going, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, You must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while they were asleep. we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story is told among the Jews to this day. This is the word of God for the people of God. The virus, COVID-19, is here. People we know are sick. People we know have died. And people across our state and our country, people around the world, millions of people are sick. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. There is no denying it. It happened. The abrupt and yet uncertain ways in which we all have responded are here as well. In one way or another, we are all experiencing disruption and disconnection from our regular routines, from our plans, from our people and our places. We all have questions, the who, what, when, where, why, how, for which there are so many answers and perhaps no answers at all. Our leaders and experts are not in agreement. We ourselves, within ourselves, may not be in agreement. We may be uncertain of who or what to believe about what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. Or we may be determinedly believing that the one answer which helps us sleep at night and gets us out of bed in the morning is the only answer we may be determined that everyone else should believe 
it's the right answer right along with us. Most all of us crave a certainty that will give us a semblance of control in what may feel like a chaotic and out of control time. Instead, we get conflicted reports, questionable data, political maneuvering, and dubious pronouncements. And we may find ourselves grabbing for whichever one we can get a hold of. Hmm. Some things never change. That's where we start in the Gospel of Matthew's account of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus of Nazareth is dead. And he's buried, having been condemned and executed by the religious and political power brokers of his day. And they are not done yet. The next day, the day after the execution and burial, the chief priests and the Pharisees come to Pilate with a plan to keep control of the narrative, to keep control of the people. In Matthew's Gospel, the chief priests and the Pharisees represent the men who control the people of Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside through a particular way of practicing the Jewish religion of that time. They, in turn, were controlled by the occupying empire of Rome, represented by Pontius Pilate. Jesus and his followers are part of the Jewish religion at that time, among the people oppressed by the Roman conquerors. And throughout Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has troubled the authority of the chief priests and the Pharisees, calling into question this particular way they have of practicing their religion, of relating to God. Jesus is recognized by his followers as one who speaks and acts with authority, with the authority of God, without the blessing of the leadership in Jerusalem, without concern for the rule of Rome. That's what got Jesus killed by them. Jesus' relationship to God that they could neither understand nor control. Now, with Jesus dead and buried, these religious leaders have begun to feel like maybe they've gotten things back on track and they want to be sure it stays that way. They want the followers of Jesus and everyone else to know what happens to upstarts who question their version of the story their interpretation of how to practice their religion and relate to their God. And that's how Matthew's gospel tells the story. Matthew is the only gospel writer who includes this part of the story, where the chief priests and the Pharisees go to Pilate after Jesus' burial to ask for guards for the tomb. Matthew is also the only gospel writer who includes this part of the story where those guards are bribed to say Jesus' disciples had stolen the body. Some biblical scholars say this is because Matthew was writing at a time when the conflict between the established Jewish leadership of the day and the emerging leaders among the Jewish followers of Jesus was raging. Christianity, as we think of it, was still just an offshoot movement within this Judaism. And we know there's no feud quite like a family feud. So whether it was in the days after Jesus' execution or decades later when Matthew was writing his gospel or even today, there are always folks trying to control the narrative, trying to get their side of the story to be the only story, often at the expense of someone who's in that same story. And then when the usual version of the story gets disrupted or disconnected, it sends us all scrambling. In Matthew's Gospel, the story of Jesus' death and resurrection comes with a remarkable kind of disruption and disconnection. An earthquake. There's an earthquake as the crucified Jesus breathes his last. And as we heard today, there's an earthquake as the stone is rolled away to reveal the empty tomb. We might take those earthquakes 
as reminders that it is God who tells this gospel story. A story that is so much bigger than any one person or group who may be trying to tell it. This God who spoke creation into being, this God whose word became flesh and lives among us, this God does have a remarkable way of telling a story. When God tells a story, no matter what happens, no matter what, God breaks through whatever walls or barriers, containers or even tombs we may have built. When God tells a story, no matter what happens, God turns the distortions and the distractions and the outright lies we tell, the lies we believe, God turns that into a truth we can depend on. When God tells a story, no matter what happens, God brings fresh starts, unimagined possibilities, and even new life into the story that God is telling. And when God tells a story, no matter what happens, there will be room in the story for you and for me, and for everyone else who's been pushed to the edge or kicked to the curb when someone else was trying to control the narrative. So when there's no denying what happened, whatever it may be, when we are faced with disruptions and disconnections in our lives, when all we have are questions, and all we get are conflicting reports and questionable data, political maneuvering and dubious pronouncements, when we need a narrative that has room for us, room to belong, room to become, and what we're offered is a narrow slice of nothing, when that's the way of it for us, to whom will we listen? Will we listen to the loudest voices, to those who will power and authority at the expense of others, to those still trying to rein in the audacious grace of God? Will we not listen, turning inward, clinging tight to what we already know, with no free hand to accept something else from God? Will we find distractions to numb us from engaging in a story at all? Or might we turn to God, listening for our place in the gospel story that God has been telling from the very beginning, the creative, life-giving story of God with us, living among us, dying for us, bringing new life to us. For sure, God's story doesn't always give us the certain answers we may crave or follow the paths we might choose. But in God's story, there's a place for each of us, a place to encounter the risen Christ, an invitation to come and see, and a call to go and tell God's story with our lives. God's story will always be the one that expands our lives, invites growth with deeper and wider relationships, and has a way of offering well-being, love to everyone. God's story will always be the one with meaning, purpose, and love for each of us, drawing us into ourselves as well as beyond ourselves. I encourage you to take some time later today or this week to read the resurrection story again in Matthew's Gospel. 
the end of chapter 27 into chapter 28. As you do, notice the disruptions and the disconnections. Listen to who is telling what version of which story. And then take a bit more time and prayerfully reflect on the stories in your life today. Notice the disruptions and disconnections. Listen to who is telling what version of your story. Wonder where God's voice may be speaking to you. It's my hope and my prayer that in these times of pandemic disruption and disconnection, we may all be listening more closely to God's story, learning together how to live ever more deeply into who God is calling us to be in that story and telling with our very lives the love story that God's story is for each of us and all of creation. Thanks be to God. Our weekly offering is one way in which we respond to God's word in worship. I'm encouraged that so many of you have continued to give faithfully through these uncertain days. I'm grateful for your commitment to proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ through the ministries of this congregation in this time and place. It is my hope and prayer that each of you will find ways to continue to give of yourselves this week. You can give financially to Memorial United Methodist Church online or by sending a check in the mail. You'll see our contact information at the end. And even though we are receiving our offering in ways other than passing the plate along the pews here in the sanctuary this week, I'd like to offer a prayer of dedication for all that we have received over these past weeks. And so will you please join with me in a spirit of prayer. 
We confess, O oh God, that we are often overwhelmed by the needs in the world, hunger, homelessness, unemployment, ignorance, injustice, deceit, violence, and now pandemic. Yet we give to you, aware that all we have and all we are is gifted to us from you. We trust that by your spirit, what we give may be a step toward doing something together rather than just worrying about all that we cannot do alone. Bless our giving that together we might offer healing and love in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Each week we also share our prayers together, our joys and our concerns. We have our prayer request cards. And those of you for whom we have email have received a prayer list for this week. Our prayer list is also posted on our website, and I trust that you will hold those on our list in your prayers throughout the week. You can also contact us with new prayer requests in the week ahead, and we will be glad to pray for them and include them in next week's list. For today, let's take a quiet moment to offer those prayers that are on our hearts, knowing we pray together as the gathered body of Christ. Let us pray. O risen Christ, we come to you in this Easter season, looking for signs of new life and fresh starts of resurrection possibilities. We come in prayer for those who are in need of your healing and for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We come asking for your courage, your patience, your endurance and your strength for those whose lives are uncertain, for those whose lives are difficult, for those that live and work in harm's way, in places they once thought would be safe and secure. We pray, Lord, for grocery court, excuse me, grocery clerks, for truck drivers, for farmers and postal workers, for caregivers, nursing assistants, housekeepers and janitors, custodians, for those who prepare and serve food and those that clean up after. We pray, Lord, for those who have poured their lives into businesses and wonder what may be left. We pray, Lord, for people in other places, in other situations and settings for whom our lives look amazingly blessed for whom what we take as given has never been given to them. Lord, help us to see it all through your eyes and with your heart as we seek to be your disciples. And now will you pray with me as we have been taught in the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So thanks for watching and worshiping with us. I hope you'll check back again. And until then, as we conclude this time together, I'll leave you with this Easter blessing. Take courage. May you be filled with the power and the promise of the risen Christ. May you go and share the gospel story in which disruptions become new opportunities, disappointments become fresh starts, and even death leads to resurrection life. Amen. <laughs>